session. Uh, and we've got uh, an exciting lineup of people. There is a change in the program. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, you won't see Carwin Jones up there. He just spoke uh, during the last session. And so we benefit from the switcheroo in that regard. Uh, with uh, Mamre Stevens coming in to replace uh, Carwin, uh, but she's still delivering the uh, same uh, paper topic, uh, same title, called A Loving Excavation, Discovering Maori Constitutional Thinking. Uh, now, there is a conference program that's got her bio in here, so I, and everybody can read, so I won't particularly read that out, but I just want to do uh, pick a couple of highlights of that, and that uh, Mamre, of course, is... Uh, with the Faculty of Law at uh, Victoria University Wellington. She's been there now kind of approaching four years after being in uh, Russell McVeigh uh, in an earlier life and a probation officer even earlier than that. So, so this is perhaps going downhill. Uh, from, you know, she's, you know, it was my, even most uh, significant when she was in commercial ra radio broadcasting. So I don't know, but you know, or some might suggest she just can't keep a job, can't, gets bored easily with careers. Uh, Vic is hoping that she won't get bored with this one and that she's going to stay on. Uh, she is, of course, uh, having an incredible impact on uh, legal scholarship uh, in Aotearoa uh, and in a variety of ways, not only in terms of her own legal scholarship, but of course as being the driving force uh, behind the uh, wonderful new Maori language legal dictionary, uh, Hepapakupu Reoture, a dictionary of Maori legal, legal terms that was published a little bit earlier this year by LexisNexis 2013. But uh, today, uh, she, we've already got a little bit of a buildup from her because uh, Carwin was kind of quoting her in the opening of uh, his presentation during the last session. So let me ask you just to give a warm welcome to Mamadi Stevens. <laughs> Uh, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat. Um, I talk a bit like a duck at the moment, recovering from a virus, so please bear with me. Right, as by way of preliminary, preliminaries, if you like, I just want to just set out a couple of points from two scholars that helped promote or point me gently in the direction that this paper is going to take. <coughs> oh, yeah, thanks. One of these is um, Lady Palmer, who in 2007 put out an uh, article called New Zealand's Constitutional Culture, whereby he asked a really important question. What is the New Zealand constitutional culture? And he defined constitutional culture as being New Zealand's the mindset New Zealand of mindset or a set of attitudes that relate to the exercise of public power. And by the same breath, Alex Frame in 2000 talked about the need to ensure that we undertake a loving excavation of our constitutional traditions. He said, be wary of seeking to build the perfect house, the perfect edifice, the perfect termite hill, if you like, of New Zealand's constitution. We really need to be undertaking a process of excavation, which is, I'm delighted to see that's the kind of theme of this conference. So when Matthew asked his question about what New Zealand constitutional culture is, he came up with three values that were very preeminent. Pre um, authoritarianism, egalitarianism, and pragmatism. We hear a lot about pragmatism. We've heard quite a bit about it already today. The obvious leading question for me was, of course, well, what about Māori attitudes to the exercise of public power? And then that leads to a broader question, what might we call Māori constitutional culture? Some of this is been covered a little bit by what Carlin was saying earlier on today, but I wanted to make <coughs> three points again by way of preliminary discussion. <coughs> Excuse me. I use the phrase civil, deci civil decision making power rather than public power because at the time Māori constitutional culture was developing in the early, late, late 18th and early 19th century, and even to the mid and even late 19th century, according <coughs> to some scholars, New Zealand public power really wasn't established as a coherent um, entity, if you like. The institutions of, 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 of New Zealand public law were arguably not fully established and in place until at least the middle of the, the 19th century and beyond that. 
So Māori constitutional culture had already been developing for some time. So I prefer to focus on the notion of civic decision-making power um, rather than public power. Second point, very briefly made, the inquiry, any kind of inquiry into Māori constitutionality must of course include the Treaty of Waitangi, but it must also go beyond the Treaty of Waitangi. We are sometimes, I think, hemmed in by the treaty discourse. And so I think it's a really great chance at conferences like this where we can step back and say, and ask broader questions about the nature of Māori constitutionality. Thirdly, Māori constitutionality is not just synonymous with handy labels that we tend to try and place on things, perhaps in wider discourse, autonomy, rangatiratanga, self-determination. These are um, shorthand labels that need to be unpicked. So I, I tend to try and think we should steer away from those when we're really looking at constitutional traditions. Okay, so being given the direction by Matthew's piece on, on looking specifically at what might be determined to be Māori constitutional culture, okay, that's a small ask. Um, luckily, we had at hand a really fantastic, and we have at hand, a really fantastic tool not a spade, but still, it's the legal Māori corpus which we've been collating at the um, law faculty <coughs> between the years of 2008 and 2010. 40,000 pages of Māori language uh, text related to Western legal concepts, uh, digitised and, and presented in such a way that we can analyse chunks of the corpus or the whole corpus itself as a way of discovering um, Patterns, lexical patterns, word patterns, language patterns, even grammar patterns. It's a lexicographical corpus, it's a big word, it's one I'm really fond of because I didn't know it before I started on this journey, but basically it was a corpus designed to help us get to the point of being able to find Māori legal terms in those documents to then create a dictionary. So that's why we came up with a corpus in the first place. But the corpus itself is a fantastic tool for other kinds of scholarship. All right, so some of you may be already aware of this, some of you won't. Um, so I just wanted to point out the text categories in the legal mind corpus because it's a big corpus. It's eight million, or just shy of eight million words of running text, uh, not including numbers. That takes it over the eight million mark. So you can see the number here of uh, categories. We have six categories of text. So we, we spent a lot of time designing the corpus so that it would be a, a useful and reliable photograph of Māori legal language. Um, so the first category is the biggest, crown language. So that comes from the Hansai, or Kahiti, that's the Gazette, translated into Māori. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Generated in Māori, I should say. The Native Affair Committee, Affairs Committee reports, government pamphlets. Uh, category two, very important category, Māori community generated language. So we wanted to capture as much as we could uh, texts that were being generated from within the community, not mediated by a crown lens. Statutory language, its own particular type of language, acts and bills, translations thereof. Uh, category four, the language of deeds largely. Most of our land deeds are uh, what would comprise this category four, but also some contracts and some other agreements as well, that the text of which have been included. Uh, the language of courts and tribunals, such as hearing transcripts, court evidence. Um, proceedings from the Māori land court where they have been captured in Te Māori. And then finally, six Māori governing bodies. And we've already heard today uh, about uh, the Kōtahitanga parliaments, as well as the Kingitanga, pa Kingitanga Te Kauhanga Nui, um, <coughs> and other bodies that are Māori, that were Māori bodies, but they were uh, generation quasi-legal, if you like, if you're looking at it from the Western perspective, texts. So all these things taken together gave what we thought was a representative picture of Māori legal language. Now, we've got a great big text, set of texts, 8 million words worth. How do we begin to identify Māori const constitutional culture from this kind of resource? So, luckily help us have had in 2005, there were the, um, uh, the Constitutional Arrangements Committee reported, and as part of that report, there was a handy appendix, which some of you might have seen, including constitutional milestones that were deemed uh, by that particular committee to be of relevance to Māori. So I had a look at these, I'm just putting them up here so you can see the kind of events that were deemed to be constitutional milestones within Māori history. 
in the context of, the, of, of, of New Zealand more broadly. And so you can see the obvious ones there. Um, just one point that, uh, and I'll come back to this point later, is that a lot of these events are given legitimacy by gatherings. So just keep that in mind. I'll come back. I'll come back to it. And then it carries on over the page. Uh, and the one at the bottom here, passage of the Foreshore and Seabed Act, actually wasn't included in that <coughs> uh, list because partly I think it was a timing thing. But we decided we would include it. So. Having determined there was a list of constitutional milestones of relevance to Māori, of course they can be uh, disputed, but we took that anyway, and we looked in our corpus and we said, well, okay, are there any texts that relate to these particular milestones? And yes, there were. In fact, we gathered what we called, well, I called the milestone subcorpus. Out of the giant corpus of 8 million words, we found nearly 1 million that were directly related to those constitutional milestones. And so what we found, what I found when I took these texts and I ran them through a program called Wordsmith Tools, there's a very handy feature of Wordsmith Tools which talks about, uh, it's, it's called the keyword feature. So you can use this kind of, these kind of tools to look at frequency. So you can see how many words occur, how often, at certain um, periods of the corpus, for example, because it's a corpus that's diachronic, it takes place uh, between 1828 and 2009, there's a lot of time involved. So you can chop your pot, chop your, uh, divide your um, data up by a year, you can divide it up by um, frequency. But the, f the tool that I used on this occasion was called Keywords, which looked for what are called, um, you might call words that are stereotypical of a given body of texts. So it's not just frequency, but it's words that, if you like, important words that float to the top. They're not just highly frequent, but they're words that appear so often in certain contexts that alerts us to the fact that they are somehow important. And I've just got a quote from that's um, um, in Scott from 1987 who designed the Wordsmith Tools program. Uh, this notion of recurrent words can be very important in the study of language and can give us empirical evidence of how culture is expressed in lexical patterns. So we came up with a bunch of what we call keywords from the milestones mm -hmm. course. Now I'm not going to stand here and say that that gives us uh, empirical evidence of Māori constitutional culture. I can't claim that. What I can say is this gave us a starting point to begin to focus our excavation. So these were the keywords, and we're only going to look at one of them today because I'm not going to have time to go through them. But interesting with what Carwin was talking about first on the list, and most key is tikanga. Then pitihana, petition, interestingly enough. Kawanatanga, government, go government, government, governance, province, governorship. Ritinga, ways of doing things, custom, habit, or practice. And I just want to flip across to the next page because we're going to look particularly at runanga, which I think is a very important term, and it's, it's in the paper that you've, uh, you might have copies of. Whakahaere, practice and manage. Kotahitanga, again, a key word. Now you have to be careful with words like kawanatanga and kotahitanga because they're also titles. But kotahitanga in itself is a concept too, so it's unsurprising that it's key uh, in these, this collection of texts. And bearing in mind what, Ma, what uh, Carla was saying earlier today, mana is also a key word. So Many of these words are also featured in Tamata Puninga, the, the customary lexicon that's been published by uh, Victoria University Press in October of this year, which I can't wait to see in my hot little hand. <clears throat> One point I did want to make was, what I expected to find was rangatiratanga. I expected the word rangatiratanga to have a certain stereotypical presence in these texts, and it didn't appear. And I thought, okay, that must be me, so I'll just rerun it rerun the text, I checked through the whole corpus, any which way I chopped the corpus up and analysed different texts, the whole corpus, all the milestones corpus, rangatiratanga was not key. It was frequent, but it wasn't key, which I think gives us a little bit of a warning. Not that rangatiratanga isn't an important concept, of course it is, but rather I think than look for evidence of values being expressed, you're better off, when you're looking for evidence of constitutional culture, looking for actual practices. And that's why I resonated with Matthew's approach, because he takes a, 
a constitutional realist approach. And I think we need to be looking at what people are doing, not necessarily what people say they are doing about what they say about what they're doing. If you get my drift. So Rangatiratanga obviously is important, but it wasn't a key word in our in our results. So what do we do with this data? There are certain themes that come up. If you look at those words that I put up before, those key words, there are certain themes that you can see evident in them. One is that the words themselves, particularly words like, like uh, kawanatanga, kōteitanga and rūnanga, look at collective decision making. And I'm going to also say collective decision making for civic ends. Um, I'm not going to have time to say much here about the development of Māori civic constitutionality. But uh, certainly collect collectivity is an important value that we need to be focusing our lens on. Secondly, if you look at those key words again, what also arises with words like rūnanga and pitsihana is the notion of participation and Māori input into civic decision making. So that's what was useful about the key words and looking at the data, the lexical data, was to give us some starting points for the inquiry. It's not the end of the inquiry, it's just the start. Now, I won't have time to go over this, but this notion, and Carl talked about this too, that if you look back over the span of particularly late 18th and early 19th century up to the 1830s, you do see the growth of Māori coalescing together, sometimes for warfare purposes and sometimes not, and particularly by the signing of the, uh, the Declaration of Independence and the Treaty, coming together, acting collecti collectively for disinterested or supra-tribal ends. So we can see this civic collectivism, I sometimes call it civic phenomena, developing. But I want to concentrate um, specifically on this word runanga to kind of illustrate both the notion of civic collectivism and also um, that group participation. So the key words alluded us to these ideas and then we can kind of go back over further primary sources and other secondary scholarship to, 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 to dig a little bit further. And this is just a point that I made earlier. Of those constitutional milestones, runanga, which of course is assembly, gathering, um, occurred by way of or were given legitimacy by a public gathering of Māori. I was interested in Sir Geoffrey Palmer's paper earlier on today, where he, he rightly noted how extraordinary the 1850 meeting was, but I'm also thinking there are an awful lot of meetings going on across the sweep of the 19th century with hundreds of Māori thousands of Māori even, where they're gathered in one place making decisions to affect all or some or most Māori. So the process of gathering to make decision, decisions by way of runanga is an extraordinarily important one. And in my paper I go into a little bit more detail about the phenomenon of runanga and how as a customary concept uh, we see evidence of it from Ngāmu Teatea for example of the notion of runanga uh, and then as the, as the 19th century wears on, this idea of gathering to make civic decisions for the benefit of all or most Māori begins to gather pace. And so Francis Dart Fenton, who we've had mentioned today as well, he, um, at this stage in 1860, was a resident magistrate, so all the papers that we've had today are kind of uh, coalescing into one another. He made this very interesting observation, some of you may be familiar with it, about the power of the runa. The chief alone has no power. The whole tribe deliberates on every subject, not only politically, but even judicially. They hold their committees, translation there, on every private quarrel. In the case of war, an old chief will be the paramount dictator, but in times of peace, he's an ordinary citizen. And I like this phrase here. Mā te runanga e whakatū ya katuaha. If the assembly constitutes me, I shall be established. So this is an ex expression that Fenton says, he heard by chief of rank and perfectly represents the public sentiment on the question. Also the sources, just um, bearing in mind one of the earlier papers, lots of accounts of children being present at Rūnanga and being present at the decision making. And European observers getting very annoyed at this. Women and children should not be involved. Alright, so <clears throat> Rūnanga as a phenomenon, as alluded to us by the keywords, um, have an extraordinary path that you can see tracked through the 19th century and indeed the crown begins to try and co-opt the runanga phenomenon um, by the middle of the, of, the, um, of the 19th century. Um, 
Gunner George Gray's District Learning System, which was a failed experiment, attempted to set districts up with, with locally elected runanga that could then deliberate on, on decisions. Um, was established and did work for a while in certain areas, but uh, kind of fell over. Uh, interesting too that um, the Crown's use of Māori language, the use of the word runanga begins to appear a lot in Māori generated Crown documents, uh, lang Māori language documents, the word runanga for whare runanga, parliament. Um, so the, the lexical appropriation by Crown sources of the word runanga is also, I think, uh, interesting. The importance of runanga is also reflected in Māori civic architecture. The middle of the 19th century is an extraordinary time of house building. 24, I think, between the 1850s and 1870s, 24 major whare runanga are built for people to gather <coughs> at and make civic decisions, not just for hapū, not just for tribes, but for inter-tribal debates and inter-tribal decision making. So there's, a, there's this extraordinary flowering of art and architecture that goes along with um, this growth of civic collectivism as expressed in the runanga, but also runanga themselves express and provide the mechanism by which Māori participate in the decision making. So uh, it's an extraordinary time and we can still see the importance of the word runanga today, of course, we often hear it in, in, in the context of uh, tribal uh, settlement or post-settlement organisations, um, uh, trust boards, etc. Uh, but also in the activity itself of people gathering. So I'll just put up the example of the, the Pokai, 28 Pokai um, Tainui Confederation. So there's a lot of material there that I've kind of just skimmed over, but in terms of implications for constitutional, this is just the start of our exploration. There's much, much more to do by virtue of looking at those keywords again and I think words such as tikanga and mana bespeak an importance to Māori constitutional thinking, for example, of correct procedure and the standing of individuals and the standing of groups. So, so there's more to be done in exploring how those words and how those concepts um, are expressed across the 19th century. Of course, we haven't even touched, really, on how these, these Māori constitutional ideas are now being expressed fully in the 20th century, 21st centuries, and I would say that there is an unbroken line, but we need to explore that further. So I'm kind of just setting the 19th century roots for a 20th and 21st century exploration. So what I would say is that as a result of the directions that our texts gave us, that we can start looking at the idea of civic decision-making power being exercised as a means of meeting collective obligation for civic ends and that it ought to be carried out, that kind of decision making, in such a way that preserves group participation and public input. So whatever we do, however <coughs> our constitution develops and grows over the next years, these are the kinds of things I think will be important, some of the things that will be important to Māori. Not just the expression of values, but also the maintenance of certain practices. And I just want to finish with uh, <coughs> the observation, and I haven't got time again to develop this, the notion that these practices, these values, and there's other evidence besides in the modern context that we can also look to, where you, I think it's possible to identify what I have called the Māori Vamos. So a Māori collection of citizens who are prepared to act collectively for civic ends. Not unitedly, not politically unifiedly, but certainly for civic ends, collectively for civic ends, and that they're, they are able to be identified, the Māori Deimos is able to be identified by a number of mechanisms, by virtue of the tri tribunal, by virtue of the land court, by virtue of the Māori electoral option. There's a whole lot of things that can enable us to identify the Māori Deimos, and we can see the growth of the Māori Deimos in the 19th century, um, which, as I said here in Parliament, is not the same as the Māori ethnic group. There will be people in the Māori ethnos that will not be in the Māori Deimos. But they utilise collective choice to, a, to collective ends while also preserving the exercise of collective choice for interested collective ends. So far, I have to the EU ends. There's a tension there. But that tension between these two different types of collectives has marked also Māori uh, 
political growth and constitutional growth over the last couple of centuries. And they're not fatal to each other. I suggest that worldwide there is a new eco-constitutionalism tradition. We just haven't noticed here. So when we are adopting, when we're looking at revising our constitution, we should be maybe looking at some of these trends. Um, if you want to look at, at nations that recognise that first category of um, human rights, the constitutional human right to a healthy environment, um, it's actually 92 out of 93. That's about half. That's actually quite significant for a brand new right that's not even really recognised in international law yet. Um, so nations are putting that in, saying it's important. Um, when though you add, that's just in their constitutions, if you add the number of, I say it's not an international law, not as in customary um, worldwide, but it's in a lot of regional agreements and a lot of states have signed up to it separately. And so if you add other ways that states have implemented that particular right, which David Boyd's interested in, it actually goes a lot more back. There's actually, um, it's in the, if, if you go down to the legislation level or the international agreement level where they've signed up to these uh, uh, obligations, then there's, there's a lot more of them. That's 92% of the countries in the world. And look, it's the same ones that we're not in. There's only 15 that haven't. Um, you know, it's New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the USA, right? And there are others that we might think are not such a good company. You know, North Korea, Cambodia, Laos, Kuwait, Lebanon, China. Um, and some of those countries do it because they don't believe in individual human rights. Like China hasn't got that particular one, even though they've got other ones. Um, which they're just coming around to implementing. Um, but uh, anyway, an additional point to note in this is this course is at the national level. Um, there are a lot of countries which have sub-national uh, political groupings, like states and provinces, and they've actually got, in some of these state or sub-national constitutional documents, have got these protections in, even if not at the national level. So it sometimes depends on your division of powers in the state. Um, in Canada, six provinces have recognised a right to healthy environment at a provincial level. In America, 22 states. So 22 out of 50, that's nearly half. So even if the country as a whole doesn't. So, um, so even looking at these pictures uh, of the national level, it's not the whole picture. But even, even this is still a different picture from what we normally see here. Um, so I think the last picture of these that I've got. Um, this is just a breakdown of your 193 states, of those four different anthropocentric rights that Boyd focuses on. A government duty to protect the environment is 140 out of 193 states. That's actually quite significant. It's the most common one in there. An individual right to healthy environment, 92, we've mentioned that one, and that's again only in the constitutions, not when you look at wider levels. An individual duty to protect the environment is 83 of them, and then other procedural environmental rights, only 30, but then this is a constitutional level document, so we wouldn't expect some of the other rights quite to be up that high. But I think it's surprising that we've got 30, personally. Um, so, um, I, I do expect at a legal conference that some people will be interested in what some of the other rights actually look like. Um, I've talked pretty fast, I might get time. <laughs> um, I, d I wasn't planning to go into them now, I thought that's one thing I wouldn't get time to do. I've got a lot of them on PowerPoint slides though, if, after this, if people want to ask questions about what some of these look like in other countries. Um, and maybe, I think the next one is, I'll just put up the Stockholm and the UN draft principles, you know, which are the 1972 and the 1994. When Man has a fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate conditions of life, and an environment of quality that permits a life of dignity and well-being. I mean, it sounds reasonable. Right? And that's the kind of things that people are putting in the constitutions. Right? Um, the UN draft principles, all business have a right to a secure, healthy, and ecologically sound environment. Some of them are mostly just saying a healthy environment to cut off the extra words, so people don't argue about what these little extra words might mean. You know, some people are just putting health off the typically healthy. But, um, so, what do I think we need in New Zealand? Well, I think we need them all, of course. Um, I think we need something at a high constitutional level, right, such as in the preamble and a fundamental statement of rights and responsibilities. There could be a complete separate charter, as unlike Francis that I mentioned. We could add to the Constitutional <coughs> of Rights if we wanted to recognise the fundamental basis upon which all of our rights sit. Um, there are lots of these examples to draw on, but I do also note we have our own special um, examples here. We have an additional reason to adopt statements of environmental protection and possibly even a different relationship with the environment in law. And that's, I suggest, the Māori cultural and spiritual views of the environment. Um, and I think they should influence our approach in the area. Um, Māori concerns need not be confined to the treaty. I've actually got these should not be confined to the treaty. And that's some point that Māori just made. Um, but they should influence statements of fundamental values, right? And priorities for rights and responsibilities. They should thus influence general provisions in the constitution such as these. 
Um, indeed, I think it should suggest we should be considering the ecocentric ones that are not so common internationally. Most of them focus on the anthropocentric human rights side. But what about those ecocentric statements about our place in the world, um, independent of instrumental human rights values? Um, we, this is a very good suggestion that we would adopt all five types, categories of rights um, and responsibilities that I outlined. Now, new rights and um, the development and passage of new rights and rules is nearly always an uphill battle. Right? It can be that human rights come up against economic interests, um, slavery and workers' rights. Right? The arguments against according those were all about economic profit, but they did get overcome in the end. Right? And it could be an opinion based on inherent difference, such that, for example, um, the argued subject. Right, um, of human rights is undeserving. We got that in relation to racial equality, women's rights, and the rights of the mentally ill. And that's where we see it in relation to uh, suggesting that uh, nature has rights. Right? Um, these subjects are seen as so different in type uh, and quality from humans. Um, and the relationship with humans at the moment is characterized as hierarchical and instrumental. Right? So we, we sort of think we can use the environment from pretty much whatever we want as a dominant view. Right? Um, and that's, that view is supported at least by Western religions um, and cultural practices. But, so it's going to be hard to overcome. But just because it's hard to overcome doesn't mean that we shouldn't. It doesn't mean it's impossible either. Um, and in the New Zealand context in particular, I think we need to address it. So in conclusion, um, uh, I do think, if you just want to go over what I've said, I think we take it for granted. If we were having to fight for food and water, for example, I don't think we'd be debating on the best forms of democracy, uh, um, despite the importance of it. Um, I don't want its protection to be based on happenstance, not like today, protected under the treaty. Um, and I do think there's an environmental crisis happening right now. So in every other country of the world, nearly every other country of the world, um, their the constitutions contain environmental protections at, of some level. And almost half contain that specific human right to a healthy environment. Um, uh, so my final comment, right, is that if the state is committed to any fundamental constitutional principles or any human rights, then a commitment to a healthy environment needs to be among one of them, needs to be amongst them, and needs to be, I think it needs to be right there at the top. And I think that only the adoption of this broad range of rights would actually achieve that. So I think this is a good time to suggest that we need to start this new tradition right, in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, an eco-constitutionalism tradition. So I hope I've left enough time for questions, and I do welcome you that you might have. off right now. So, uh, uh, what, uh, so we're now on, on our last but by no means least speaker, uh, another senior lecturer at Victoria University, well, uh, uh, Dr. Grant Morris, a legal historian, also an expert in law and literature, as well as in alternative dispute resolution, which particularly leads to his topic today. Uh, busy working on a, a book on mediation, but of the one that will come out next, though, is a biography of Chief Justice James Pendergast, which particularly fits for the unearthing the constitutional uh, origins in Aotearoa. Uh, and so today he is uh, sharing with us uh, his views on a challenge to New Zealand's constitutional traditions, the history of me mediation in New Zealand in the context of Justice uh, Wink Elman's defense of the civil justice system. So I'm going to ask you to give a warm welcome to uh, Grant Morris. Um, five two. So I'll, I'll do my twenty minutes. Take it through to five fifteen. Then I'll leave it to Brad to decide what he wants to do from there. Because I think that's it's at the end. Claudia, five fifteen. I think we're down for the session. I have to check, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> in putting together the talk for this conference, I've uh, been in the process of writing a history of mediation in New Zealand. I published the first part of it in the Australasian Dispute Resolution Journal earlier this year. It's very much a work in progress. And this conference came at a good time for me because when thinking about what paper I could present here, uh, I thought, well, how can I tie in the work I'm doing with the history of mediation and alternative dispute resolution into New Zealand's constitutional traditions? Because there's some very interesting overlaps and there's some very interesting clashes that I believe are happening here. It's at that point as well that I thought about the very important and controversial speech given by the Chief Judge of the High Court, Helen Wynne-Kelman, in 2001 to the 
Arbitrators and Mediators Institute of New Zealand, in which she challenged the mediation lobby groups, what has been described as anti-litigation narrative, and how that could potentially undermine New Zealand's constitutional traditions, in particular the rule of law and the role of the courts in upholding the rule of law. So taking the history of mediation, New Zealand's constitutional traditions, and uh, Justice Wynne Kalman's talk and putting them all together uh, is what this paper is about. So for those of you who perhaps aren't aware of the uh, Justice Wynne Kalman's talk in 2011, basically the thesis was that mediation has an important role in New Zealand, uh, but its place is alongside a system of civil justice. It can only be a complement to that system, not a substitute and not a replacement. Adjudication of rights through the courts, whether in full trial or in summary form, does and should continue to remain at the heart of our system of justice. Just as when Kalman challenged the growing role of mediation in the New Zealand legal system and affirmed the pivotal role of adjudicate, adjudication and upholding fundamental rights, she also warned mediation lobby groups that any undermining of litigation will ultimately undermine the rule of law and democracy uh, in this country. So how did we get to a point where mediation as the most common and well-known form of alternative dispute resolution in recent years, how did mediation come to challenge New Zealand's constitutional traditions in this way, or at least be perceived to challenge our constitutional traditions, and pose a possible threat to fundamental rights, the rule of law, democracy? How did this come about? So what I want to do today is just pick up on a few points from my paper. It's at the back there and it's on uh, the Dropbox if you want to read the whole paper. I'll just pick up on a few points, the ones I think that best illustrate the tensions that are going on here and then give you my final thesis as to uh, the role I think mediation has played in New Zealand's constitutional traditions thus far. My overall point is that in the context of history of mediation in New Zealand, mediation has most often complemented our constitutional traditions and even flows from our constitutional traditions. At times, perhaps it has challenged them in the way that Justice Wynne Kalman was referring to, but that is the exception rather than the norm. An important point to note when charting the history of mediation in New Zealand and when comparing it to a similar history in other jurisdictions is the pivotal role of the state in leading to the introduction of mediation regimes, especially since the 1970s. The executive has been the primary instigator of mediation in New Zealand's legal system. So if Justice Wynne Kelman's claims are accurate that there's a potential undermining of the rule of law in New Zealand, then the executive should potentially carry some of the blame for undermining these adjudicative constitutional traditions. So at this point I went to uh, Philip Joseph's seminal work on the New Zealand Constitution to uh, engage with some of the points he makes about the constitutional traditions we inherited from Britain. And a, a big part of his book focuses on parliamentary supremacy and the pivotal role that it plays in New Zealand's constitution. Now, because this paper is arguing that most mediation in New Zealand, most mediation regimes have resulted from statutory initiatives by the state and by ultimately the legislature, which creates statutes, then mediation's legislative base and New Zealand's commitment to parliamentary supremacy could suggest that mediation flows from New Zealand's most pervasive constitutional tradition, that is, parliamentary supremacy and a form of parliamentary supremacy that is not restricted by a written, entrenched uh, supreme law constitution and one that was seen often used to override decisions made by the courts as is permissible under New Zealand's constitutional traditions. And of course there's a whole lot of debate in literature as to uh, whether the courts can in some way challenge parliamentary supremacy, um, but we know that it's a fundamental fact of New Zealand's constitutional system that this doctrine um, is, is, is a pervasive one. When Justice Winkleman is worried or, or expressing concern about possible undermining of the rule of law. I suppose she's talking about Dicey's third limb of the rule of law, uh, as phrased by Joseph, the superiority of the common law over constitutional codes as a method of protecting rights. So it's that part of the rule of law that she's particularly focusing on. 
But as Joseph continues and points out, this third limb of diocese has little relevance to the rule of law doctrine, <coughs> and in particular it seems to potentially contradict parliamentary supremacy. Now, just in line with some of the previous speakers and their uh, assertion that one of the constitutional traditions of New Zealand is pragmatism, well, the development of history or the development of mediation in New Zealand's legal system is definitely a history of pragmatism, especially in the last five decades. It's a response to pressures, societal pressures, pressures within the legal system, cost and delay involved in litigation, major social trends which have challenged the way in which we view dispute resolution and we view uh, <clears throat> society. The other point I want to make before moving on to a particular, particular areas of law so I can highlight my thesis with examples is that if, as I ultimately get to arguing, mediation can be seen as a developing constitutional tradition in New Zealand, it's not one that flows from our British legal heritage in the way that so many of the others do. And if anything, it's one that we have co-opted from the United States, perhaps Australia to some extent, uh, and can be seen as one that's developed over some time, but is more recent than others that have been discussed at this conference. Now, an important omission must be noted, and that's this paper doesn't cover examples of Māori mediation. Uh, the main reason being is that these forms have not been incorporated into New Zealand's legal system in a systematic way. There are a few, unfortunately, examples of customary Māori ways of resolving disputes with a third party uh, that we can see uh, specifically uh, in our legal system. I do spend quite a lot of time with the first six or seven pages of the paper dealing with definitions. I don't have time to do that today, but you can go and you can see how I define my terms. And in particular, I raise questions about the definition of civil justice, which is used by Justice Wynne Kelman and also Dame Hazel Yen from the United Kingdom, who Justice Wynne Kelman uh, uses her arguments to some extent as a basis for her own speech. And the way they tend to phrase civil justice as being that which occurs in the New Zealand context anyway, in the district court and the high court. So a broader definition of civil justice is, of course, those matters of law which are not criminal. And I think that broader definition is a helpful one when we're dealing with big issues as to where the mediation can potentially undermine the rule of law. Because if we separate out areas like family law and employment law, which some of these uh, <coughs> arguments do, I think restricting analysis in that way uh, cannot provide a comprehensive picture of mediation's history uh, in New Zealand and engage with these big issues. So I want to just choose a couple of examples uh, from areas of law which perhaps uh, can be used to uh, back up the claims that I'm making. The first one, and the most obvious one to use, is that of employment law. Employment law has probably the richest history of any area of law in New Zealand of using alternative dispute resolution and one which harks back, or harks back um, even before 1894, but in particular to the Industrial Conciliation and Arbitration Act of 1894. And if we look at developments since that time, we can even see a, a proto form of mediation being developed under the name of conciliation, in particular the 1908 Amendment Act which brings in conciliation um, in a structured way. And while it's not mediation, employment mediation, the way that we understand it today, it can definitely see, be seen as uh, a development over 100 years, which perhaps leads to the mediation that we have today. And in that sense, it's probably got the strongest claim to being an early example of mediation developing as a constitutional tradition in New Zealand. Mediation, in its modern form, and the modern ADR movement, which is dominated by mediation, is something which New Zealand really inherited from the 1970s onwards, often looking to models from the United States and Australia. Mediation formally became part of the employment legal framework in the Industrial Conciliation and Amendment Act 1970, which set up the Industrial Mediation Service. And then, of course, right through the different regimes of very different ideological uh, perspectives, mediation continues 
until you get to the Employment Relations Act 2000, which re-establishes a formalised government mediation service managed by the then Department of Labour. So looking at employment mediation, acknowledging its long history, or at least the long history of alternative dispute resolution, which culminates in mediation in New Zealand's legal history, it could be argued that employment mediation actually derives from New Zealand's constitutional traditions, and in this case, a resolution of industrial disputes through conciliation and arbitration. Employment uh, adjudication, the employment court, continues in New Zealand uh, alongside a successful statutory mediation regime. So I find this difficult to see how, in this area of law, employment law, which now, of course, and for some time has had its own um, in New Zealand's history, specialist courts, but how it can undermine the rule of law. In fact, I see it as a developing constitutional tradition which uh, is part of uh, New Zealand's rule of law. The other examples of mediation that I choose to look at in this paper, and I choose them because they're the most prominent forms of mediation, and also they, I think, provide a good cross-section of the use of mediation out of the legal system. They don't necessarily have this long history that we can chart in the way that employment mediation does. But I want to pick up on a few of those, uh, and then I'll conclude. Family law is another example we think of when we think of mediation and in particular the form of judicial mediation that developed uh, from the Family Proceedings Act 1980 uh, and is currently, of course, under major reform um, in the bill before Parliament. But prior to the 1960s, family law did not incorporate alternative dispute resolution beyond basic negotiation. Uh, as you'll probably be aware, it was resolved through the traditional legal system uh, and it was often done in a very awkward and uh, damaging way. As societal changes occurred in the 60s and 70s, in particular the rise of a uh, number, rising number of divorces, that way of resolving disputes in terms of family law was considered uh, inappropriate uh, and the Royal Commission of the Courts in 1978 uh, suggested, recommended, the setting up of the family court. And it's rather particular and unique, well not completely unique, but idiosyncratic uh, approach to mediation, judicial uh, mediation conferences. Again, it's a government initiative that reflects the reality of alternative dispute resolutions in New Zealand. This is a statute which is, uh, of course, to some extent a reaction to what is occurring in the courts and calls from the profession uh, to set up a specialist court, but ultimately uh, as a, a few commentators have noted when they've looked at the development of ADR in New Zealand, the state has taken a lead. So family and employment law can be seen as the standard bearers for mediation in the New Zealand legal system, especially since the 1970s. And in both cases, mediation is an obvious fit given the importance of ongoing relations, uh, relationships and the paramount importance they play in these areas of law. In fact, as early as 1982, it was being predicted that mediation, the new mediation approach of the family courts, was proving so successful, even though it had only been going for a couple of years, that it might eventually spread to the general courts, replacing, to some degree, the traditional adversary system, which, uh, 30 years later, you can see echoed in just Winkle, Justice Winkleman's uh, concerns uh, about mediation potentially challenging or undermining the civil justice or the, the civil court system. Yet, when we fast forward from these worries, these statements in 1982 to the present day, the adversarial system still remains dominant in New Zealand. Uh, and it demonstrates the limitations of any challenge by mediation to New Zealand's constitutional traditions. If indeed mediation is challenging New Zealand's constitutional traditions or uh, perhaps, as I'm suggesting, becoming part of those traditions and complementing the existing traditions. Now, I say this with a caveat because what's going before Parliament right now in terms of the reforms of family law is, is, is revolutionary, it appears, to be uh, a chance to introduce more uh, mediation and perhaps the form that we might expect mediation to take. We still don't know exactly what the details of the Family Dispute Resolution uh, Service are going to be, but it's going to watch the space in terms of uh, how mediation might develop in family law.
pick up on a couple <coughs> more examples uh, and then finish off. One is environmental law, and I want to make sure I do this one, given that Cathy's just presented a paper on environmental constitutional issues. Uh, this is an area where I think you can see the success of mediation, but also, again, the way in which it's complemented existing constitutional structures and traditions. In introducing the Resource Management Act in 1989 and bringing mediation clearly into uh, the environmental uh, law area, uh, then Minister of the Environment, Geoffrey Palmer, stated that, quote, a significant new feature of the bill is the provision of greater encouragement for mediation in all of the processes. That means that parties will be encouraged to reach agreement amongst themselves and that the informal pre-hearing meetings can be held rather than the parties always saying, see you in court. I think the way that environmental law has developed since then, though, can be has, in a way that has avoided a turf war between litigation and other adversarial uh, processes. So while mediation may have been introduced by the government into environmental law in that way to reduce litigation, I think we can see in a fairly effective partnership between adjudicative bodies like the Environment Court and uh, mediation operating side by side. Tenancy law is another example where when the Residential Tenancies Act 1986 was introduced, it was very clear the politicians were worried about the slow and expensive uh, dealing with these matters in the uh, normal court structure. Uh, the model was taken from South Australia and implemented in New Zealand. So it was a reaction to practical problems. Uh, and it's one, I think, that's worked well since uh, 1986, the uh, uh, use of mediation in tenancy law. I do touch on the Weather Tight Homes Resolution uh, Service as a more recent example, uh, mainly because I think symbolically it's important in the sense that this major national crisis, the main form of resolution, dispute resolution chosen to resolve it was mediation. And we know that there's been very important cases, for example, the North Shore City Council case in uh, our high, highest level courts where precedents have been uh, made which have performed a very important public role. But in some respects, adjudication is a supplement to mediation in this area rather than the default option, thus switching the traditional relationship between the two forms in New Zealand's constitutional system. But I still don't think that we've got a major problem with undermining the rule of law here because we still have those important decisions that have created precedents while we have what is uh, not completely perfect but uh, an effective mediation process going on at the same time. Now, Justice Wynne Kelman's focus uh, was on, in particular, on the District and High Court and the way in which um, mediation operates in conjunction with those, obviously a lot of commercial cases and disputes uh, uh, at play there. The researching of the history of mediation and commercial disputes in New Zealand is very difficult because of um, a lack of evidence uh, and there's work to be done there. Just to say that this is a good example of where the state hasn't played the lead role in uh, promoting mediation. It's one where mediation practitioners, private interests have played a major role uh, in commercial and encouraging and, and promoting commercial mediation. Okay. Right. One minute left. Just to, to conclude then, as a law student in the early 1990s at um, Brad's Law School, the Waikato Law School, I remember being told many, many times that mediation was the way of the future and that by the time you know, I was uh, practicing law or doing whatever I did with my law degree, that mediation will have replaced litigation. My father kept telling me that all the time. Uh, it hasn't come to pass. It hasn't come to pass as at 2013. And I think it was probably a, a rather ambitious um, goal, if that even was a goal at that time, which I'm not convinced that it was. Perhaps mediations have reached its natural limit in New Zealand. Perhaps it's colonised the areas of law that were obvious to colonise. And even though it continues to be introduced into new statutory regimes and private mediation opportunities continue to grow, the actual growth of mediation, as I try and calculate statistically um, in the paper, has plateaued. Uh, since that exponential growth earlier uh, in the 70s, 80s and no early 90s. So while the rise of mediation in New Zealand can perhaps be seen as a challenge to New Zealand's constitutional traditions, 
I argue that a more accurate way to view this historical development is that mediation complements but even flows from constitutional traditions. And in particular, statute law has been the principal way of incorporating mediation into New Zealand's legal system. This is an assertion of Parliament's will, an assertion of parliamentary supremacy, perhaps the most distinctive tradition in New Zealand's constitution. But I also don't think that the way in which this has played out is really undermining that third limb of diocese, the role of the court in upholding the rule of law, as I've tried to, to point out here. So while some of the mediation lobby groups probably do push a bit hard when it comes to uh, selling mediation uh, and perhaps do run with an anti-litigation narrative that overstates the negative aspects of adjudication before the courts, uh, I think that a more constructive way of dealing with mediation's role is to say what role does it play within our constitutional traditions rather than kind of separating it out and saying, well, you can stay over here, don't challenge what we've got, um, you've got your place, but actually how we can see it as, as part of developing uh, constitutions. I mean, it seems to me highly unlikely that mediation will seriously challenge adjudication's privileged role in our legal system. Uh, I think the most likely outcome is that both forms will continue to coexist, sometimes clashing, but that being the exception rather than the norm, but more often complementing each other and, most importantly, providing a variety of ways in which New Zealanders can resolve their disputes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grant. So we've had three speakers that have kind of continued the discussions from the earlier part of the day of the unearthing of constitutional traditions from the early 19th century on. Uh, but they've also brought us up very much to the 21st century in trying to grapple with some of the issues that are very much uh, front and center. Uh, in, uh, uh, involved in any re-examination of the current New Zealand constitutional framework, how the language of the Constitution could change, what some of the core values might underlie some, uh, some of those changes, and how that now, with Grant's last paper, how any of those changes might also proceed to affect uh, the role of the general court system and the way in which disputes are, are addressed uh, within New Zealand. As Grant also indicated, his paper is available on Dropbox and uh, Mamadis is as well. Uh, Kathy's is available from her uh, directly, uh, both the text and her PowerPoint. Uh, we are kind of uh, past time. I'm not perhaps we've got uh, time for maybe one or two questions before I should call the session to a close. Uh, David? And do you need to identify himself, I guess, perhaps, to this, since it's being recorded? Um, 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 and the particular word that you picked on was runa. Um, and as a generalization of many parts of the world, when a colonizing government appropriates a word, it tends to fall out of favor amongst the colonized. And so what's really interesting about your word, and maybe you can give an explanation as to why you think that might be so, is that although Gray and others tried to colonize the word runanga for government purposes, it still <coughs> was favorably used in, in Māori circles. And for, um, and for Catherine, um, Polly Higgins and the crime of ecocide, any comments on that? <laughs> um, so, I don't know if this is on. Yeah. Do, okay. Um, Polly Higgins and the Crime of Ecocide. For those who don't know, Polly's um, from the UK and she has tried to suggest that we need to uh, promulgate, you know, um, criminalise ecocide um, generally in international law and domestic. Um, so she wasn't going to put that, oh, I don't think it was meant to be constitutional level, but I wouldn't be surprised if she'd be aiming for, you know, any adoption. Um, in terms of this, it would be part of the new suite of things of problematizing what's going on and coming up with a new solution. Um, in this case, you see what, that, hers is a suggestion that if we make it a crime to commit ecocide, as in the killing of ecosystems, um, then that is something maybe people won't do it because they'll be punished. And so that would be a new, a new solution for an existing problem. So it would fit in that sense. But whether it's constitutional, you'd have to, you know, decide so it's not at the moment in any of those constitutional examples. But I was nothing to say it couldn't be if we wanted it. Uh, Kia ora, David. Thank you for your question. I guess 
Yeah, I find it interesting that the meanings of runanga have multiplied, and partly that's in response to who's been using the word. So one of the things we found when we were uh, carrying out our diction constructing our dictionary was uh, how polysemic, polysemic, polysemic <laughs> Māori is. And so for the fact that runanga was used in a particular way pre-1820, uh, then carried on with this kind of civic obligation or civic collectivism, it, it created this meaning in the in the middle of by the middle of the 18th century, 19th century, sorry, and then the crown uses it in a particular way, and then in the 20th century it starts to be used in the in the, in the context of trust board, uh, and those kinds of things. There um, sometimes there's a little one of the reasons why it was good to do a dictionary is to show people the journey that that kind of word has taken. Because it's in our dictionary that you know that later meaning of trust board is a contemporary meaning, whereas the earlier meanings are kind of more obviously available from pre-1909, for example. So uh, I don't know if it's an explanation as such, but it's certainly true that the, 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 the meanings of words multiply according to the stresses put upon them, I like guess you'd say. I'm not sure if that's an answer to your question, but it's a phenomenon we observed. Yes. Were there any words that popped up pretty regularly that the Rao has changed so much over the past 130 odd years that you didn't know what they were and couldn't interpret them? Sorry, were there any words that popped up with regularity that you just that the Rao had changed so much over the past 130 years that they couldn't be interpreted anymore? No, it was the other way around. So the words that we're using in some of the modern texts are so opaque that we found it really difficult, and Ty will attest to this. Uh, Taiyahu um, here, and there's been a couple of other research assistants. The, so the meanings have been so kind of a clouded and opaque, uh, modern meanings, that in actual fact, I'm sure that were the situation reversed and people were reading those words in the 19th century, they, they may not understand them, but we had very little problem. In fact, it was beautiful how simple and clear the Māori was of the 19th century. What we did find, however, is that the words that we were collating and putting in our dictionary Pre-1909 and post-1970, there was actually not a lot of connection between those words. So people were using different words post-1970 than they were pre-1909. I use that because in the middle there was a big gap of a lack of texts. So there were some texts, but not many. So what, there's, a, there's a lack of a bridge, I suppose you'd call it. So it's not that it's mutually unintelligible, but it's, um, it shows that as Māori lost its civic standing, uh, then those words passed out of the But there hasn't been any problem in working out what they meant after we've done them yet. <laughs> oh, I was just having a question about the anglophone world and it's um and the third question, sorry. Um I just wonder if there is a, a cultural um kind of argument that could be brought out of your um map that you showed earlier about why those why it's the anglophone. cultural and historical mass there. Well, there is, um, I mean, obviously there's something um, there, but um, the, the, the two things that first come to mind, one of them is that people often put this right to environment along with some economic and social cultural, even though um, it's actually always been interpreted that way because people talk about the greening of human rights, i.e. say a right to life could be interpreted as meaning um, a right not to be polluted and you know, other things like that. Uh, and so, and some of those have been argued in some countries as affecting the right to life in Europe. They win. In America, they don't. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so there is something to do with that idea of um, what's civil and political, what's economic, social, cultural, and which ones are, you know, which ones talk about negatives and which are positive. Um, but at the same time, there's a caveat. And there's, what, there's a book I, when I was actually looking at updating and looking at what has come out of this. One of those five books I've got on the slide is called Looking for Rights in All the Wrong Places. It just came out, I think, in June this year. And I just got the e-book yesterday. And this just says that this whole American emphasis on civil and political rights and negative things, the whole interpretation is completely wrong. Because all the states have got the positive economic social goals. And they've got the environmental one. There's 22 out of 50 got those. 
So if you're looking at actual American practice, people neglect this whole side of things and you think it's just this narrow, narrow um, one that matches you know, uh, what we've taken from the, the things that we've been side of things. So there is a, there is a cultural element to it. Um, and um, I don't know how much wider it reflects in other aspects of culture or it's just this narrow legal rights culture side of this principle. There's something like that. And one, one last question. I've got a few um, comments from Amelie, but also um, a question for um, Catherine. Um, Amelie, uh, in your presentation, you said that uh, Ray's Dunanga system was a failure, although you, in your previous answer you kind of addressed some of those issues. I would have argued that Ray's Dunanga system was the catalyst more so for the Māori Trust Board being from two folks or myself. I'm very much aware that this kind of corporate Māori trust boardism affected us first, yeah. 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 Um, the other one is, although we hear so much about the Crown and how important um, the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi is, a comment that I would put forward is, um, a few writers recently have come out and um, said, well, at the end of the day, um, more meetings like Hinana Hiuta Hinana Kitai, which established the Hini Tango, were far more important constitutionally in this country um, than the um, Treaty of Waitangi. And at the end of the day, not a lot of Iwi signed the treaty. So, whereas it's relevant in our constitutionalism, uh, if we as Iwi still maintain some kind of mana motu haki. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing for um, Catherine was, before you started speaking, um, I, I put down a question which was Pachumama, Bolivia, Ecuador. Um, the question that I align with that is, as Māori, since we are a minority and these ideas would be um, very easy for us to follow along with, um, is there an issue of us being a minority um, is it an issue of what you're talking about to become a reality, us being a minority? Because we would, in general, support generally kind of that idea with Kate Jackson and all that. Um, um, I think that's a really good question. Um, yes, it is an issue, actually, because, uh, no, I agree, those two examples, Ecuador and Bolivia, are exactly the two that I had in mind when I said there are two that have adopted ecocentric approaches to environment and put those rights in their constitutions. And they're on one of my slides, yeah. um, or on a couple of them. Um, but uh, actually, they're not the only ones. We've also got some other sub-national bodies, like Santa Monica, some American states have done it, uh, more cities and towns. But it is an issue because the, of the dominant Western view of how we relate to our environment. It is a resource. You know, that's what's enshrined in law. We like to do, what we, you know, do whatever we want with it, you know, within a, within a, a bound. I guess a, a bounded range, but it's not, it's still quite a wide range, yeah. right? As opposed to um, uh, you know, very Māori view of being at one with the environment or descending from it, right? And you can't, just, you have to pay a lot more respect, yeah. right? Um, and you don't, you don't treat it like a slave. I, yeah. In other papers, I've said we treat it like a slave. Yeah. And um, so, yes, uh, we have seen some movement towards some, uh, some steps of recognition of a Māori worldview and environment, such as the agreement to recognise the Whanganui River as a legal person that recognises the Māori worldview and puts it into our law. And it's very different from our Western view um, and a hierarchical view. Um, so there are, but it, it would be hard, it would be definitely hard because of the minority status to implement that widespread of the law. But it's yeah. not impossible, this is probably the one place in the world that we could do it. Yeah. Um, and just one thing following on from that, recently I read an article by Ali McMahon, the environmental planning professor from Hunter, um, identifying one of the things about dairy intensification, um, the two problems facing Māori were, one, um, globalisation, um, and that globalisation was driving intensification, and one, the neoliberal planning structure. Um, I believe from what you've presented today that the RNA with its neoliberal background um, would be at odds with what you're presenting. If you, in your ideal world, were to come up with a planning framework 
what would that look like? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you think words or less. Okay, I've got number two. Green governance. And number two, there's a book by Burns Weston. He, again, just came out with that earlier this year. He's got a really good suggestion for how to overcome the neoliberal capitalist agenda, along with the state-centric hegemony. Okay, lovely do. And he's got some really good background chapters on this, integrating things like the 99% movement um, and the Occupy movement. Right? Um, and, and then coming up with an actual governing structure and set of principles to get around it, not just complaining and criticizing or saying we need to do something different or, you know, and he's actually, uh, I'm in the middle of finished reading, in the middle of the book and, and with, um, trying to write a review of it, but I'm very impressed. And that's got, if you're interested in that kind of thing, I really suggest it. Well, I think that brings the session to a close. Let me ask you all to thank our three exceptional speakers this afternoon.